we should talk about the, the uh, probably the coolest survival gun ever made that not a lot of people know about. Um, and this goes, the credit goes to our friends, the Russians. TP-82 Cosmonaut Pistol. Explain. TP-82 Cosmonaut Pistol was issued to cosmonauts. Not for fighting in space, but not, not for fighting in space. All right, everybody, how's it going? We've got uh, Jimmy here on the mic, Mark to my left, and Ryan Muckenhern, esteemed colleague and uh, frequent guest uh, on the podcast here. And we're going to probably talk about some calibers, I have a feeling, which we talk about frequently with uh, you, Ryan, but we're going to talk about the topic of survival rifles, actually, today. Cool. And uh, this one is a... I really like this topic. Now, when we had our podcast on subguns, for example. I enjoyed talking about that one in particular because anytime, you know, as a as a firearms enthusiast, yes, there are, you know, as 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 firearms owners and users, there's all the training that we have to do, there's the practical applications of them, but sometimes you just have to boil it down to the firearm enthusiast level, which is just the fact that um, Guns are cool, just like cars get you from A to B, but there is certainly a culture that loves them for what they are, how they work, their mechanicals, their functions, and all the innovations that have happened behind them. You could probably say the same thing for, oh, I don't know, sewing machines or refrigerators, anything. Um, But survival rifles are up there as... um, I actually kind of would describe them a little bit similarly to subguns in the fact that we haven't seen a whole lot of different looking radical designs when it comes to the main battle rifle for example you know um everything from the m1 garand all the way to the ar-15 or the mk-18 or whatever they call it now that the military uses Granted, we've went from a wood stock to polymer furniture and whatnot but actually over that really long course of time the individual changes that led us to where we are now weren't all that radical. I guess from the M14 to the M16, kind of, but then from the M16 until now, not that radical. But when you look at survival rifles, just like when we looked at subguns, all of them look different. Yep. All bets are off. You can do anything as long as it seems it is packable, fires a cartridge... Actually, I don't know. We have to get into the cartridge yeah. thing about what survive Because I... Sometimes it's, oh, it fires 22, but then there's 9 mils, there's ones that shoot 223, there's there's all kinds of arguments about what caliber you should be using or what even kind of firearm you should be using. Some people even say pistol, rifle, whatever. Um, it just seems that it needs to be packable and somehow a lot of times painted lime green, you know, for zombies. And uh, they've always got weird storage compartments all over them. A lot of them generally tend to fold up or take down somehow uh, or have some means that they come into pieces, Uh, but they're really interesting, and I always find it fun to just look at what people come up with. I mean, that was a long intro. Sorry. You guys got to start talking. No, it's perfect, though, Jim. I mean, there's so much variance between each model. Like you said, all bets are off. Everybody's building a little different mousetrap, and and, uh, they're super interesting, though, and they, they serve a very important and unique function. Let let me ask about the important and unique function because it is it is unique. Important though, I I want to I want to get into a little bit here. Mark, it's not to it's not to downgrade what you said, but I also wonder to myself. Okay, if you found yourself first off I think there's multiple different kinds of survival situations. If, for example, Red Dawn happened, I don't think I want to go around with a takedown 22. Nope. But I am going to be trying to survive. Ooh. It's a podcast first. That's pot. There we oh go. My goodness, Mark. Had the ringer on. The ringer was on. We're on episode 100 and who knows what. And Mark is... Anyway. <clears throat> it's the machine's fault. Okay, but Red Dawn goes down, right? And we've got an army from an enemy country coming in and trying to invade. And you are trying to survive in that situation. But like I said, the old takedown rimfire isn't exactly going to be my firearm of choice. Right. If you find yourself somehow stranded in a forest that you got helicopter dropped into, maybe... Your aircraft. Right, right. 
there obviously had a reason for making the survival rifles that we have today. And even there were some military adoptions of survival rifles, right? Because you had the M9. Is that what it was? M6 oh, no, Scout? No, 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 not M9. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the M6. I just flipped the six upside down. Sorry. Uh, you had the M6 Scout. And did they... That was the fold-up one yes. that had... Um, you could store like four tens and 22s in the buttstock, right? Yes. And it was an over-under... Mm-hmm. Shotgun slash rimfire. And then you had, uh, was that the only military one, I guess? Or was there also the, like, because Henry has one where everything yeah. comes yep. apart and stores in the buttstock. The AR-7. The, butt the AR-7, yeah. Yeah, the buttstock floats. Yep. Was that one kind of designed around this military pilot I, application? I think where- I think so. I don't know that the AR-7 actually saw anything or went anywhere. Yeah, okay. Same. Wow, no, the M6 Scout did go somewhere and saw some things. Uh, but the the AR seven, I I don't believe has seen any kind of adventure, okay. uh, in that in that context. Um, but it floats, and the M six does not. And there's a there's a point for the AR seven at that. M mm-hmm. six um, is pretty cool though. Is that where the original was? That like the original survival rifle, or were there nope. survival rifles well be- before I, that? I think there was some well before that, and. Uh, you know, I think one of the the more interesting ones is actually not a rifle, but it's a uh, drilling, a three barreled gun that the German Luftwaffe had for their pilots. And these things are extremely collectible nowadays. Hmm. Um, and they were a sixteen gauge side by side shotgun with a center fire rifle underneath. And <clears throat> I'm a bit foggy on the chambering and the center fire. It was either eight Mauser or it was nine point three by seventy four R. Um, and so somebody uh, fact- the Soviet. Nope. Cartridge? Nope. So European. Anytime I hear R at the end, I just assume it's Russian. Right. What, what does the R? Rimmed. Oh. Yes. Okay. So many of the rifles at the time were a single or double rifle, non repeater, and the rim cartridge or the rim component held the head space on it. Got um, it. The Russians were very good at making rimmed cartridges feed through magazines, through turn bolts, and, and things like this, though. Uh, but that was a really cool gun um, and uh, was a, a survival thing. And I. I don't recall the dates of the M6 Scout when that really started to take off. Um, same application, though, Air Force. Yeah. So underneath the seat, um, you know, whenever I think of this, I think of, of Owen Wilson and behind enemy lines. Like, would things have been different if he would have had anything other than his service pistol? <laughs> you know, had he an M6 Scout, could he have survived better than he did? I mean, he did, right? He made it out. He did. Um, that keeps you up at night, too, huh? Right. All the time. <laughs> I mean... I haven't slept in weeks. I know. it. So a uh, lot of it was around Air Force, though. Yeah. Like, if a plane crashed, yeah. then you're in the middle of nowhere. You yep. can, theoretically speaking, survive. Yep. Now, let me let me go back to defending myself here, Jim. Okay. It's Please gonna, do. It's important if you end up needing it. That's true. Correct. And that's what you have. Correct. How many people do you think have a survival rifle and they never take it with them, though? I think that's the point. It's always with you. It's always in your truck or it's always in your airplane. Well, but to Jim's question, it becomes a novelty at that point to many folks, right? They're like, oh, I got this just in case. Is it there? Right. Are you are you packing it? Did you bring your tourniquet? And, and a lot of times what I wonder is, <laughs> did you bring your tourniquet? That's a good point. Other things that are survival items and necessities. But a lot of times you'll have people who will own a survival rifle. It kind of just sits in their safe. Because it's cool. I'm not, again, I love survival rifles because I think they're cool. This little badger here that folds up with a wire stock and basically looks like it's made out of hardware store parts. I love this gun. I don't take it with me everywhere. It's actually, it was just in the safe. I just grabbed it out before this podcast. A lot of the people that have these things, though, they do carry their Glock around everywhere. And that ends up being Mm. the thing that they have on them, you know? Um... So that's why I think sometimes these survival rifles, or they carry, or, or heck, I mean, heck, they've got a they've got an AR-15, yep, in the back of the truck, yep, or a Mini-14 or something like that. I th- I think to uh, maybe better answer that question, we do have to look at the folks who these were intended for use with. So pilots, right? So you know, it might not be feasible to have a carbine even in its form in the cockpit with you. Exactly. Whereas you could have a, you know, a, a service pistol on your chest. Was the pistol the ideal device? I'm not really sure. I think, um, you know, to speak to what, what the Germans had 
in their thought processes with with the the drilling that they had under the seats was, you know, if a if a Luftwaffe um, pilot went down in the Black Forest and needed to, you know, shoot Capricelli to feed himself, but may run into a red stag and or an enemy, he would have the rifle to do so as well. Yeah. Um, whereas now, when we're driving around in the everyday scenario, kind of you know, driving around, I say that. I mean, when we're operating in our everyday scenarios, it may be more convenient to just carry said carbine. Mm-hmm. If we were all traveling in planes, though. Well, I think there's. I think we got two kinds of survival Plane here too. Plane world. Yeah, we got defensive survival. Yeah, and some you know whatever that scenario may be where you know you're defending yourself against other people. Right. And then you have straight like f- food procurement survival where you're just trying to live off the land and scrape by right. and get De- what you can. Depending on where you might crash or find yourself in a situation though where you need food, you may also still need defensive. It could be both. Yeah. You know. And that that's what's always, I think, been interesting to me around when you have the caliber mm. selection or the cartridge selection as to what goes into these survival rifles. Twenty two long rifle has long been one of the main cartridges or chamberings that you see in these kinds of firearms. And it's one of those things where I hear survival rifle, I think twenty two. But I don't really think of why I always think 22. And of course, there's also the ones that are like some people will say, oh, well, actually, you got to get the 22 WMR or whatever. You know, it's like a little bit hopped up or something. But uh, I guess I can't I can't put a finger on why the 22 is the best choice. I suppose if you're trying to hunt for small game that would keep you alive or something that you'd be able to cook and eat, then you're not going to totally vaporize the thing when you shoot it. Right. Packable ammo. Yep. Yeah, a brick of fifty twenty two cartridges is about two and a half inches by an inch. Well, that's and even, a good point. Even yeah. think if you were going to carry five hundred rounds with you. Yeah, five hundred rounds. It, and I think maybe maybe the intent was if if you had to use said rifle, you were behind your enemy's line, and at that point, clandestine operations were afoot, and the report of the twenty two is much less than that of the, you know. 30 out six or eight millimeter Mauser or that's true in the case of the Russians, the, uh, seven, six, two by five, four R, which, and think if you suppressed it, um, we should talk about the, the, uh, probably the coolest survival gun ever made that not a lot of people know about. Um, and this goes, the credit goes to our friends, the Russians, TP 82 cosmonaut pistol. Explain. The TP 82 cosmonaut pistol was issued to cosmonauts, not for fighting in space, but not, not for fighting in space. Okay. Um, it is a very well-built gun. It's a combination gun, much like the M6 Scout. Uh, 5.45 by 39 in the bottom barrel. And it was like an intermediate shotgun gauge on the top. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And it came with a full complement of devices to improve or... Um, I guess, uh, help you in your clandestine operations. Should you find your uh, Russian spacecraft crashing at any point on the Earth, um, whether it was Siberia or the jungles? Oh, of South this America. was for actually mostly if they crashed on Earth. Yeah, I mean, it if wasn't you, for getting into space battles. If you did get into a space battle, it is a very space gun. Um, it looks like something you'd see out of. Uh, it's very. It's a very it's peculiar. Very, gun. very golden eye. Very golden eye. Yep. It's kind of like a desert eagle meets the receiver for a little bit of an AK-47, and then goes out to a uh, Mosin Nagant foreign, but then just gets chopped off at the end of the foreign. Extremely end. Russian. Very much so. Yes. Is, are these all single shot? Well, there's or, there's two barrels. Or wait, is it? Oh, it's no, there's over three. Under, you said. Yeah. There is three. Right? Oh, it is. Is it three? It's two rifles and one shotgun. I can't remember. I think it's oh, two yep. shotguns. He is correct. There is three barrels. There's two shotgun two and shotgun, one, one rifle. rifle. Okay. Yep. I think it's like a 36 gauge or a 38 gauge or something like that. Sure. 
Um, and then the five, four, five. And there's a little stock thing that comes yeah. off the, uh, the bottom there. And that's, that's, the, that's the biggest, interesting. that's the biggest bummer for collectors of these kinds of guns. though. like you, you get a whole subculture, like you'd mentioned earlier about mill serp collectors and that we've done podcasts on that in the past where you can get all these really cool guns mm. at fairly low prices. They're extremely functional, they're extremely durable, and they're easy to obtain a TP 82 cosmonaut pistol. You you, you have to do paperwork on it because it has the butt socket out. Oh, yeah. dang it. So that's the doozy. If you were to even find one complete, and I don't know that right. you can find there one. There were so many parts with it, it looked like. I'm sure it's hard to find oh, it's one a full, with Yeah, full it. complement. Like trying to find it, a BMW with all the tools in the trunk. It looks like one of those ideas that was good in theory, but in practicality, I'd, I'd be curious. I look at that and I go, man, if I ditch the plane, like, or the spacecraft that's probably not what i want with me I, it's better than a sharp stick that's yeah, true which I, I think what all these things boil down to yeah it's better than a sharp stick. yeah can yeah. we talk real quick about space battles um yeah. i learned the other day that you actually can fire a gun in space yes how um well is the bullet sealed into the case and whatever oxygen was in there the, the, is enough to ignite it yeah so just like you could shoot it underwater oh okay and then if you shoot, and let's say you're in Earth's orbit or something like that, and you shoot and you miss your target, it could come all the way back around and hit you right in the back from what <laughs> yeah. I heard if you don't get out of the way. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah, that, that's a doozy. I, I, I don't know a lot about gravity or space. Um, I've got a cousin that's a, an astrophysicist, and so he could answer that question perhaps a little bit better. What I want to know is because there's no... Th- theoretically, if we were far enough away from a gravitational pull of something, yeah, does the bullet accelerate to its maximum velocity potential and then maintain that, or does it just indefinitely? Ooh, yeah, like if, does that this thing hit question. warp speed? I think it would accelerate to its maximum velocity potential, and then that's where it would ride until it would have gravity impart its forces on it and yeah. pull it off course or something. Um, but uh, it's a really good question, and I've always wanted to know, too, there's a lot of folks in outer space right now. As of yesterday, we there's just, even more. We just threw a couple more up. Are there armaments that we don't know about in outer space? I'll tell you what, if you want, if you play um, Call of Duty, which I know I've brought up a few times, there is a mission where um, you're on the International Space Station and some bad guys come in with guns and start what, shooting it up. What they, ever, hey, whatever happened to the, the Star Wars thing, not the movie? Remember, like, are you talking about Space Force? No, I'm talking about it was called Star Wars. I'm on. I have no idea. I, yeah, I'm drawing a blank. Sorry, Mark. Maybe I'm making it up. So we don't know. Circling back, I think the Russians really had the ultimate survival <laughs> weapon, TP-82. If anybody has one, I'd love to see a picture of it in real life. Um, it's a that's a neat that's a neat rig. Uh, but again, like in in application, it was for oh my gosh, this is the worst possible place I could be right now. I need to procure meat. I need to defend myself and try to make it to a rally point. Yeah. Ergo, this strange smattering of cartridges. Yeah. Uh, and, and the M6 follows suit with that, as does the Luftwaffe drilling. Um, you know, and I think that in, in design was where they were going with it. You know, yeah. we needed to be able to pull a grouse out of a tree or a goose out of the sky or something um, and, and still have a center fire or rimfire cartridge for hitting something bigger. Perhaps. Right. Ish. Um, so the one thing when you're talking about, so like with the drilling, mm-hmm. you said that that had actually a little bit bigger chamber. I mean, it, you had a 16 gauge yep. in it. Whenever I've thought about a survival rifle, I've thought to myself, I've gone through, obviously I have one of the 22s, actually I have a couple of the 22s, I even have, I've got the Savage uh, little polymer black stock thing with a red writing on it that's a 22 over 14. Yeah, 24. Yeah, I've got one of those and uh, I have a little, you know, Henry 22 lever action, whatever. Um, They're all fun, but if I ever actually found myself, I've, I've wondered... I know you mentioned that the small little brick of ammo is extremely easy to pack and you get 50 rounds. But I've always wondered, do would I rather have a lot of little ammo or would I rather have less big ammo? Hmm. Hmm. That's a tough question. 
And I, then there's also the issue of, say, compatibility, where then, again, we get into the point where is it solely you're in the woods, you're not in a dangerous place per se in terms of fighting forces trying to find you and kill you, and you're more just trying to procure food. But, but I wonder to myself, if you did end up getting yourself into a situation where you did need to defend yourself then I'm not going to exactly want to do it with a rimfire. And then and then let's say now, now, and, and the funny thing about survival rifles, which I think we have to also get into, survival rifles are one of those things where a lot of the use cases where when you're, as you're hitting add to cart that are going through your head are things that are completely imaginative, you know? Like... My spaceship, Let's say, crash. yeah, my spaceship <laughs> crashes. My spaceship crashes. Crashes. The Russians have invaded America, so I happen to crash on the west coast, around the actually the northern part of the state up here in Wisconsin, which I know that we, there was fear back in the Cold War that the Russians were just going to pop over the, With Arctic. the subs, right? So anyway, Russians are here. So now the woods are not only dangerous, but I also need to feed myself. You know, so you're going through all these situations. It, it gets very imaginative. And then all of a sudden you have to kind of step back and be like, am I really going to find myself in that situation? But anyway, let's say you did. And now you've <laughs> got this guy here, like a little 1022 or something like the, the little badger here. And now, okay, I've gone from trying to survive to being in a war. <laughs> yes. My two cents go. If these aren't very compatible with what else I might find or pick up, or you I've know, got, I, I, I probably find I would probably find something nine millimeter or two twenty three, and then I'm either going to have to ditch this or switch, or just not be able to use ammo that I find, whatever. Right. If you get to pick one gun, I've got a little bit of a theory for this, but please, Ryan, proceed. Is it a three hundred wisdom? No, it's not. <laughs> but now you got me thinking. Yes, it is. Uh, if I was going to have one thing. Um, Okay, let me let me back up one one question. Let me tell you a question. Uh, did I crash my aircraft and or spacecraft? Yeah. Okay. It's going to be a very lightweight rimfire. Yours is? Okay. Yeah. Because if that is the situation I am in, I am going to need to be highly mobile and very discreet. Yes. Right? Okay. So... And not that you couldn't be highly mobile and very discreet. Even if the Russians are invading at this point in time? Yeah. Still, okay. Yeah. Highly mobile, very discreet. Uh, and you could be discreet with a suppressor, uh, but we need to think about things like what's happening uh, to my projectile if I miss? Where are my cases going as they're ejecting? Am I able to pick them up after the fact um, so that folks don't see me? A 22 long rifle case, very small. You can push it into the dirt, nobody'd find it. Mm. Um, there's no big report with the 22. It can still kill a deer or a moose or an elk with a well-placed shot. Um, in the event that you... We are not recommending that you use the 22 long rifle as your primary mook, moose, deer, elk cartridge, for the record. Right. <laughs> not that I knew you weren't, but I just figured I'd throw that out there before anybody takes to the internet with <laughs> wrong information. <laughs> in the event that you found yourself becoming combatant, Okay, yeah. You could party with a twenty two long rifle. Um, it is the cartridge that's used most in the world for assassinations. Correct. Right? There there are and you can find this on the internet, uh suppressed Ruger ten twenty twos that are in current use right now with some allied forces. Um so it, Well and I would think too, like in this scenario, it's probably just you or like that uh, That's the that's the intent, yep. And you are I would think that you are hiding before you are fighting. And so if you end up fighting, you will be at pretty close quarters. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, 25, 30 rounds of 22 LR. Can I ask what ammo, what, which specific 22 LR um, cartridges slash loadings are you taking with you? Are you taking subsonic CCIs? Are you taking hypersonic? I don't know. I think... Or supersonic, whatever. I, don't know. I, I think I would like, whatever shot good in the gun. I mean, think about it. Doesn't, it doesn't really matter that yeah. much for you. What would I, like, let's say you had like a like a you know like a stinger or something like that, and then you suppressed it. What do you think that sounds? It's like? quiet, but it, you still get the crack because stinger is very fast. Yeah. So it's it's you know supersonic out the gate, um, but you'd still get a 
you'd still get a crack. But it would, you know, it's not like a center fire where you get a boom. You right. Know, some kind of, you hear this. Right. Yeah. Um, I think I think whatever ammo was environmentally sound um, f- from the standpoint of like rain is not going to affect it. Mm. Okay. Um, right. Or cold is not necessarily going to affect it. That would be that would be my goal. What would be some examples of that? Uh, I'm actually I'm not like a rimfire ammo expert. So I, I I mean all I know is I just pick up CCI. It, any 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 good commercially loaded 22 long rifle should be fairly environmentally protected. Okay. Um, but like you can get the, you can get the winter ammo too, if you want to get wild. Um, winter. Ammo. Yeah. It, uh, coatings, lubes, waxes on there to, to prevent the, that's pretty neat. Yeah. Um, not okay. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say, uh, waxes on the winter ammo because it expressly doesn't have that because then that gets really cold and hard to deal with, but, uh, just environmentally protected ammunition, in the event that you become a combatant, um, you could use that and then procure the arms of your enemy combatants, mm. assuming all goes well. Mm-hmm. If it's a twenty-two, and you find yourself in this scenario, it would be maybe harder for your enemy to locate you with the low muzzle report of this device in which you could defend your stronghold and then procure their arms and armament if, if need be. Um, can I propose a second scenario? Please, yes. Not, I did not crash my spacecraft. I do not have enemy combatants. Okay, is this like the gas in your car ran out in the middle of nowhere? Yes. Okay. Um, if it had, if it was like, you can have one thing and this is the one thing that you get. Yes. And there's not a chance of like walking to a gun store and upgrading. Um, it would probably be an H and R or similar single shot twelve gauge with a pistol caliber insert. Whoa, 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 whoa. What? Yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Your go to for in the car broke down. No, this is like this is like I'm talking twenty eight days later scenario. Sand zombies. Oh. It's just you, Jim. Just you. Yep. You're in I want to say the Pacific Northwest because, like, that's where my head goes. Where you're like, you're in the wild. Okay, that's that's fair because a lot of the a lot of the uh, survival rifle stuff does also revolve around this um, apocalyptic style. Yeah, uh, that's that's something we haven't quite gotten into yet. It it, it can marry up somewhat with the Red Dawn situation because you could end up going up against a band of marauders. Mm. The world could flood. It could be Water World, and you've got Kevin Bacon, whoever's in that movie, <laughs> going around on a. Kevin Bacon. <laughs> it's not Kevin Bacon. It's I realize not. that, but. Um, anyway, it's Kevin Costner. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> totally. Wait, which movie are you talking about? Water, Water World. World. That is oh, Kevin Water Costner. World. Amazing movie. Um, no anyway, guns. he's floating around guns? on a ship. Yeah, they had guns. On yeah, Water I think World. so. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but um, okay, but I'm yeah. Not, so this is your apocalyptic setup. So this is interesting to me though, because you're not fight. You're, this is a non. This is fighting scenario. This is a. This is um, he could have to take out a zombie. No, I don't want zombies. Uh, this oh, is. Oh, sorry. This is like. We decide. Oh, you said sans zombies. Yeah, sans. Okay, okay, so I'm thinking like I'm thinking like um uh what was that that movie about the young man who went to Alaska to find himself and and ultimately ended oh. up um oh shoot that was a good film I feel bad I've I've lost that one it wasn't uh it wasn't, Into the oh, Wild yeah yeah okay Eddie Vedder did the score for that one it was a good good film good music um like that kind of scenario you get Got one it. and there's not an opportunity necessarily to uh, resupply, uh, or trade or barter. This is strictly the procurement of game and the protection against carnivores, um, or larger herbivores that want to turn you into applesauce. Uh, and I think it would be a single shot 12 gauge with, um, a cartridge insert for a sub gun cartridge or a rim fire. Interesting. Explain the, um, inserts i didn't know that was a thing yeah really cool if you want to look them up there's a number of different manufacturers and this has been does a it, thing does it go down the entire length of no, the barrel no okay, so sorry, i'll let you carry i'm on. picking a different gun for that okay that's fine mark um so a few of them there through the course of history there have been some really interesting ones there was actually a cartridge insert for the 30-06 and 308 for use in 1903s m1 grands m1a's Model 700s, I mean, pick a 308, pick a 30-06, that you could 
insert a 32 ACP cartridge into. Oh, yeah, I think that came up in one of our other podcasts. It was either World War II guns or yeah. uh, sub guns or something like that. Yeah. And so this would be a really clever device in that you have this low report, low recoil, highly portable pistol caliber that you could use to shoot small game or even medium sized game or do clandestine ops if that was what the menu called for. And then you would also have your large cartridge for, you know, taking big game or big mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a thing a long time ago and you can, you can still buy those, but these that I'm speaking of are really expressly made for shotguns. Uh, and so they're, um, you know, about the length of a shotgun shell, uh, and they are exactly the length of a shotgun shell, I should say. Most of them are for rimfire cartridges, but you can get them in small calibers or pistol calibers. And then they have a small rifled section of the, uh, you know, device like it's we'll call it a three inch shotgun shell length. Part of it will be rifled. Oh, okay. Sure. So you end up with, I mean, you got nine mil pistols like the Ruger LCP or yep. some of those Keltec little guys, yep. and they have little three inch mm-hmm. barrels or you know mm-hmm. something like mm-hmm. that, real tiny. Yep. yep. And so you can insert the cartridge in there, put it in your shotgun, and yeah. then you have this. And that, that's that's actually kind of interesting to be shooting something out of a barrel where it's not actually, you know, we'll throw yeah. it out again, obturating or touching the edge of the barrel yeah. in that shotgun. It's just kind of flying right through. Yeah. Like the shotgun barrel's a tunnel that's yeah. going through. And Basically. Just, and you end up with this super tiny little mini barrel inside of this case, and they're really cool. Very interesting. Yeah. Yes. And they do make them in a smattering of cartridges um, because you could have – the you, you you know utility and universality of the twelve gauge, and all its loads from slug to buckshot to birdshot, and then you would have this potential center fire rim fire your operation or option for you know doing other stuff with. Um, that would be my if you can only have one. Is there a bit of a of a? I I've hung out with you for a bit now, Ryan. Is there a little bit of a romantic quality to that for you? Where if you're gonna go out, you want to. You want to be found frozen over in some tundra with this peculiar single shot twelve gauge pistol no, caliber I, thing, and I, that's I, how you want to go out. Because I'm, I keep thinking to myself, like, why wouldn't you just take a uh, something else? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> why wouldn't you just take anything? Anything but that. But that. I, I just okay. So if okay, let let me play the scenario out. We're in the PNW. Never been to the PNW, by the way. But I've seen That's movies. lovely this time of year. Is it? Thick foliage. Do they have ptarmigan there? I no, know they have r- sooties. And roughs, roughs and blues. Okay. Predominantly, I guess. So, thick foliage. We're hunting roughs, rough grouse and, and blue grouse. Mm-hmm. Or sooties. What are, I don't know what they call them up there. We always call them blue. The only place, and maybe it's the same thing. I don't know. We'll fact check this. I hear them called sooties like up in southeast Alaska, yep. but they seem very similar to blue grouse, but maybe they're different. Okay. So if I took my seven and a half inch AR, which yeah. which is like my ultimate utility arm. I'm so surprised you have one of those. Oh, yeah. You're like such a not AR guy. I am. I'm anti-AR. <laughs> uh, not not, uh, not well, from the standpoint. Whoa, whoa, before the internet Oh, goes my up. God. The oh, internet. God. Uh, <laughs> internet. Okay. Pri- you know pri- what? You use them a lot. Competition. Yep. You just kind of got pri- over it a yeah, little bit. You know, there, there's nothing lovely about them. Um, but Mark, I, in Ryan some day though, dub- oh my goodness, what we've said. Oh God, this took a turn. I'm, I think everybody a- gets what Ryan means. Ryan likes double barrel shotguns. Ryan likes all kinds of things. Ryan loves all of the uh, battle rifles we've talked about many times, and I'm sure you want some in your safe. Uh, the AR-15, it just doesn't. It doesn't do it for it. It doesn't. That's I, what you're saying. Y- yep. And, and it's for those- just like me. I'm anti Corvette. It's not because it's not a fast car. It's just I'm anti-Corvette. I understand. Yeah. I'm anyway. Gonna, I'm going to broach a question, though, as it relates to this. Someday in the future, like, will the AR-15 have that romantic quality that some of these other guns have just, of, just because of the course of time and I th- nostalgia? I think about that a lot, actually. And um, we picked up an M16A1. Oh, yeah, you love um, that gun. Which I do love. I, I didn't think I'd ever really right. get to that point. Yes. But it's like the historical significance of that arm is, you know, absolutely a real thing for me. I look at it, I'm like, this thing is beautiful. Um, even though it's black, plasticky, 
what it represents right. is extremely important to me. And the same can be said for a Mark 12 um, sniper rifle or a Mark 18. Like these are very important arms in our uh, development as an armed nation, I guess. And, yeah. And yeah. So they they are very. They important. have historical significance. Yeah. Anyway, now yeah. that we uh, now that we've caveated beyond caveat and right. what we even God, need. Right. You can't just say things like that <laughs> without qualifying them. The fact of the matter is that you have a seven and a half inch AR. I do. So clearly, you're not like truly anti AR fifteen. Not so anyway, not at all. You have one. Of I these. do. I do yes. have a seven and a half inch AR, and it would be a phenomenal uh, piece for this. Um, it would. It, it would. would. it would. It would. Very much so. Until, until Mark Winter's coming. It's very cold. Um, Winter. We, yeah, we know that there <laughs> is, we know that there are pockets of ruffed and blue grouse in the area. Yeah. And we need to procure meat without exhausting our ammunition or destroying what we're about to eat uh, because it's very important. And so I take off with my seven and a half inch AR. I could make the argument, oh, headshots only. But do I really want to risk sending a sub-quarter-inch projectile downrange at 3,000 feet per second and either missing the head of the game and fly away altogether or hitting too low and I vaporize my opportunity, effectively wasting the cartridge? No, I do not. And, and going away hungry. Correct. They fly. And so I think that a, a shotgun... In, in that context is extremely useful. Or we're hunting, and here we bump a snowshoe hare. That is four pounds of food. It's on the move. Am I going to have the level of effectiveness with my 7.5-inch AR, again, with the, the notion of conservation of ammunition and without destroying the edible parts of the animal? Am I going to be able to do the same thing as I would with a shotgun? No. Correct. So I have elected that gun um, for that reason. Let me let me ask you this because I'm going to go into when I said I'd pick something different, and I didn't realize that in, in a lot of ways it's very similar to what you were saying. Is it a 12 gauge shotgun? It is. Okay, but it's a 22 over 12. There's nothing wrong with that. Where I've got the 22. For Those are kind of hard to find. Usually people put 22 over 410. Mark's I, already got a leg up on us. Yeah, I'll get you one. Uh, <laughs> no, I, th- they make that. Yes, yeah, Ryan. They do. They do. So my thought is this. Uh, squirrels, you know, even p- potentially grouse, small game, whatever. You got the twenty two. You also have, uh, you know, various bird shots yep. for like what you're talking about there. And then for the big game, I guess, again, not advocating shooting deer or, you know, big game with the survival 22. Situation. Survival situation. Yep. Uh, no other recourse. You certainly could um, dispatch, you know, at close range with the twenty-two. But then you also have the slug option with the twelve. Mm-hmm. A phenomenal choice. I but, wasn't but, even. Uh, but let me tell you that. Uh, but also those twelve gauge cartridges. They're heavy. They take are. up a lot of space. Mm-hmm. And are they going to be available? These are questions you may want to ask yourself. Yeah, I don't what know. You, why are you going with the single shot when they already make one where it's just basically a single shot, but with your with your rifle caliber instead of having this fancy insert? It's I, just good right question, because you could lose the insert, and then what do you have? Nothing. I think it would be the availability of... I think, okay, in my head, yes. what I had in this loadout was this shotgun, and then I had the inserts for twenty two long rifle, twenty two mag, maybe 38 special or 357, you know? So it's like I happen upon a trapper's cabin. And I'm rummaging okay. through. I'm rummaging through a couple of pots and pans. Okay, this is useful. I'm putting it in my pack. Open up a drawer. By George, here is a box of 38 short Colt. Oh, great. I've got a 357 Magnum insert. I now have ammunition for it. I can shoot 38 short Colt out of that. Cool. Throw that in my pack. Hmm. I've scavenged. I do like that scavenge versatility there. Yep. That is nice. Hmm. My hopes are is after winter has come and the snow has melted and I'm able to get off of my uh, mountain, presumably, which I am. I'm actually probably I'm stuck in a basin. That's what the thing is. I can't cross. You know, I can't cross the mountain because it's too high. I'm stuck in this basin. Rich in game. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, once the snow melts, I can... I can make an expedition out of here, like like Tom Hanks did in Castaway. Build the the proverbial raft, so to speak, cross the mountain pass, find myself in a quaint mountain town where people have been circulating my picture for the past nine months. 
Um, God, what's that moment like when you just walk into town? Uh, I think it's pretty good, but I can't grow a beard, so I'm going to look really bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> Interesting. Yep. Um, okay, I'll throw you guys out an idea. And then we also got to talk about optics on survival rifles, too, because mm. I'm very curious about this topic as well. Mm-hmm. But I'll throw you out an idea. Um, what do you think about the notion of finding yourself in a scenario like this with one of those um, Roni Mm. block deals. That's a good survival gun. So if you need to be more discreet or have a small arm on you but not have it be easily identifiable from afar, uh, you could take the pistol out and throw the Roni in your backpack or something Mm -hmm. and then have the pistol on your person. For defensive scenarios. Mm-hmm. Or if you needed to take a little bit more accurate shot, you could put the pistol into... Said Roni. Said, yes, yeah. and take a little bit more accurate shot. Yes. Now, your potential downfall would be for this quick snapshot that we've discussed on Rabbit or whatever, where the shotgun does play into... have an advantage. But I seem to recall, if I'm not mistaken... In 22s, there's a little 22 caliber shotgun thing that you could put in where it shot out little pellets or whatever. Is there a thing like that for 9mm? Yes. Where it's almost like a little 9mm shotgun thing that shoots out pellets. And would it be at all viable for rabbits? If you were close enough. I think okay. so. If it was a running rabbit, I don't know. I In a previous podcast, I mentioned when a, a longtime friend of mine and I were out hunting and we brought... 38 specials for snake protection because we were hunting antelope and we thought for sure we'd be inundated with rattlesnakes and from a distance of feet it could not dispatch a jackrabbit oh really great mark your phone has been the number one it's got a mind of its own disruptor he was i think i think he was a repeat offender he was looking up survival cartridges i was trying to i don't i wasn't familiar with the roni oh that's i'll tell you roni's a cool thing i like it i think it's basically sticking your glock into a chassis that then has they make them with pistol braces now which of course is you know is what it is nowadays many people put pistol braces on many things and so you in take your Glock and you essentially an turn it into kind of like a PCC. Yep, basically, yeah, yep. yeah. Very good design. I I like the Roni option. I do because a nine millimeter would not be a terrible thing to shoot a grouse with. I don't think it'll blow it apart. Um, <laughs> Maybe it would be a little bit more viable on the bigger game. Yep, yep. It's your snapshots that you'd end up with a little bit of a tougher time with. Yep. So maybe maybe you just kind of slow yourself down and you try to you try not to flush the grouse. Yeah, you do a little bit more still hunting. Yep. Well, it uh, remember the question I asked you one time, Ryan, or I said oh, yeah. I made the statement with a question mark. They can fly. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, with that that's said, that's when we knew we were friends. That is, uh, I can tell that's a touching moment. Um, okay, let's talk about optics on these things real quick. Good question. On these two survival rifles in front of me, it's actually kind of funny. I have optics mounted up that I wouldn't necessarily even recommend, which is, and we'll get into that. I have two red dots mounted up on these, uh, little open top guys. Survival rifles are often very small, packable, fold up. You want them to fit in a pack, whatever. Uh, You want to be able to carry them around without having a lot of added weight, bulk, bumping them on stuff, getting them caught on everything. So a red dot seems to make the most sense. You get, like, uh, open-top red dot, like a Viper or a Venom, like we have right in front of us, a little crossfire red dot, something along those lines. Here's why I was saying it's funny that I have these on here and I wouldn't necessarily actually recommend them. It's because batteries. Mm-hmm. And batteries are unpredictable. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't care what red dot you have that goes to a million zillion hours of battery life. The thing that you have to realize is that battery life listed on any, it's not even just red dots, any electronic product that says it has a certain battery life, that's when the battery is at its ideal operating uh, environment, temperature, humidity, I mean, any, any of these other environmental factors that can affect your battery. Um, and so 
naturally the survival situation we all, it, it tends to be thought of as very cold or depending on where you are it might just always be cold at night you know like if you're in the desert somewhere it's gonna get cold at night and uh or you may find yourself in a situation where it's very very hot too so don't think that heat is um not gonna affect your battery as well well, and think about some of the situations that we were talking about earlier. This could be a rifle that's been under your truck seat for years. Exactly. Or in your airplane exactly. for years. Or and heat. Or a, bar- uh, 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 a barrel that you yeah. buried. Yeah. Heat is actually, yes, good point. Don't don't forget those guns you have buried in the barrel. Um, Everybody, you have a cache, right, Ryan? What? A cache? Like yeah, like a, underground barrel guns. What? Never we'll mind. talk about it later. Um, anyway, heat is like the number one killer of batteries. When you're using something that's battery-powered and heat, it drains quicker. When you store something with a battery in intense heat, it'll drain the battery. Um, cold will slow down the chemical reactions inside the battery to a point where actually if you're storing something in cold, it maintains its charge for quite some time. But as you try to use it, either it doesn't work because the chemical reactions literally just can't get going enough to power your device... Uh, or it will drain more quickly than it would if it were at like a normal, say, roomish temperature. Um, so, anyways, that's where then let's say we find ourselves. This is the only thing we rely on. This is the sighting device that's going to hopefully help us be accurate enough to not waste ammunition and then be you know able to procure food, meat, or defend ourselves. Uh, if that doesn't have a point of aim, then we are just kind of slinging lead, and that becomes a potentially dangerous situation. So, how do you guys choose a small, relatively packable optic, but one that also doesn't have this potential downside to Spitfire. it? Spitfire. I would yep. agree. I would agree. Now, you can't mount on this 1022, for example. Uh, this is the Magpul Backpacker stock. It folds down. They have a scout mount for a red dot to go out over the barrel, which I actually appreciate because Mark and I were talking about this. Let's say we take this thing apart, and if we had an optic mounted above the receiver, every time we took the barrel off and put the barrel back on, what do you think? What do you think? I'm thinking there's some potential to have some POI shift. Yes. So because a prism sight, prismatic sight, the Spitfire that Ryan mentioned earlier, it has an etched reticle inside, so it does not have um, an LED emitter that it relies on to give you the point of aim. There's just an etched reticle there that can be illuminated, but if your battery is dead, it's no big deal. It's still there. Um, that those sites do have an eye relief though, like a rifle scope does, unlike a red dot, which can be mounted in this scout configuration out front here and, uh, and be used. You couldn't mount a Spitfire out there. So you're going to have to have something. You're going to want to consider that, uh, this actually wouldn't necessarily be a great survival setup. I mean, unless you put it on the receiver, but you're going to remove its packability aspect. A little bit, and yeah. and there's the potential for the shift. The good news but, is... Do you think that that it, would happen potentially? It does, yeah. yeah. I mean, the good news is, though, that it has backup irons. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot. This flips down, yeah. I think I think if it if it was really, like, if that if that shake of the dice really fell that way, I, I'd be an irons man. Yeah. Unless I had a backup. Yeah. But if you had a firearm where there was a pretty well... It's not probably breaking down. Right. Yeah. Then Spitfire. Right. Then, yes, because we're not reliant on battery power. Yeah. I've got a 1 to 6 PSD Gen 2 on another 1022 that I had. Um, and uh, I find that to be a really nice scope to have on there. Now, of course, it's adding bulk and, and weight compared to a red dot, but having a 1 to 6 on something like this is very nice. Big time utility bonus. It, it yes, it helped me uh, dispatch a nuisance critter um, at about 50 yards or so with ease. You know, and I tried looking at it on one power, and I was like, I can get the reticle on it. I was like, well, if I'm going to take a good shot and be ethical, I better zoom in on this little guy. And Did not need to turn the illumination on either. Oh, no. I, I'd be curious, though, it, not that you want to be burning ammo, right? But, like, I, I love this rifle, right? I love the packability. I love the fact that it's an auto-loading 22 LR. I think in a lot of ways, like we talked about earlier, that is the ultimate system for procuring small game and possibly defensive measures, right? Um, 
But I would almost be inclined to put a two to seven diamond back on the receiver, knowing that I may have to burn a couple rounds. Walking it in. Walking it in. Yep. You know, yep. like, you know, all of That's a sudden. That's fair. But then also knowing that, like, I'm not going to be breaking it down after it. That's a lightweight, yeah. handy yep. rifle. Yep. I'm I'm not going to be, unless somehow just necessity dictated, I needed to huck it in my pack and run for the hills. But also, I guess if I'm doing that, I probably want to have a rifle in my hand. I think it stays broken down until your plane crashes, and then you put it together, and it probably stays together until you find the um, small town with your picture uh, yeah. all over the place. And I'd, I'd speculate, too, it's not going to be wildly off. No, and certainly not. No, I wouldn't think so. Not not so much that you couldn't make do, you know, and re-zero it if need be. Right. Um, the only thing that catches me on that, though, is then you're losing your functionality with the shotgun. Unless you were expressly going with this device. Or a similar device. Mm-hmm. So we, I the circle- shotgun is the ultimate tool. It is. It is. Um, it is. You could but, use your Mossberg but- with those inserts. Could I? You're hey, not going to have, have the defensive round volume. MC that Ryan, you can will you bust this? into the left safe? There should be. Uh, uh, it's not actually, but it looks like it is, like a sawed-off shotgun-looking thing. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, if you get in a scenario where you need to be sending multiple rounds, you uh, you don't get that with the you know the 22 over 12 or the 22 over 4. You are you or, are correct. Um, but again, what, what do you what, think you're going to have to do that? Are I'm we in the curious. are we in the behind enemy line situation? Or are we in the Pacific Northwest in the basin, uh, rich with game, waiting for the snow to melt? This is what I'm talking about. This is this is the both. This is the one. Here's the deal, Mark. I already explained. I'm going with the 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 shotgun 22 for just purely shooting critters. This is the both though? Question mark. So that's the both for defense and shooting okay. small things. Okay. Uh, you're delirious because you have uh, drank some water that was suspect. You're trying to procure a grouse, stumbling through the woods, snapping branches. They're flushing 30 yards in front of you. You cannot seem to get your head straight. Oh, I think it's down in the safe. Never mind. We do have this tiny little 12 gauge with a 16 inch barrel that breaks down. Oh, yes. shot. We that, bought it for $70 yep. on Gunbroker. Yep. That would work. That I could be the about one. That thing. It's very lightweight. Does the shotgun come back into play then, Mark? You could take that grouse at 30 yards as it flushes. Most certainly. But, um, but also, once let's say the bad guys are after you. Here's the problem. Here's my. Here's the thing with survival rifles, and I, I think this is why people have so many different opinions of what makes a survival rifle or the perfect survival rifle, is that people are okay buying a gun for a certain thing until it becomes to this, until it comes to this, and then they're like, well, it needs to do everything. Well, then the short answer is right. you get an AR-15 with a seven and a half inch barrel, and then you have a pistol caliber upper and or a rimfire upper for it. There's your ultimate utility. Then it's the best of both worlds. What about the shotgun part? Well, Mark has disqualified the shotgun. I, do, I just told you that I didn't do that. Here's what I think. The thing, the thing that, I, to your point, Mark, like you said, everybody all of a sudden, when you get into a survival situation, it needs to do everything under the sun. The other thing is that everybody's buying survival rifles for a survival situation that they've dreamed up in their head mm-hmm. that likely won't actually end up being the survival situation. This is true. So, first off, anytime, and and I know I've brought it up a a few times in this, and there's probably, I don't know, some people that are laughing, some people that are about to to throw their radio out the car, but, like, every time I think of a survival situation, for some reason in my head, the Russians come in, and they're also trying to kill me at the same time. It's just because it's the Red Dawn effect. It is. It's the Red Dawn effect. And also, at the same time, everybody that I know has turned into a zombie, and they're also trying to kill me. And suddenly it becomes this like really messed up situation. But if you actually really boil it down to what's likely going to happen is that you'll likely get broke down somewhere and you might be stuck out overnight and you better make sure that you actually have a lot more on you or maybe not even necessarily a lot more, but just other probably more important things on you than your gun. Tourniquet. Tourniquet. A light. Of some Ooh, sort, yeah, mm. flashlight, and um, oh, I found some one of my means, good flashlights yesterday. <laughs> some means of making fire, 
Yeah. Right? I mean, there's so many other things that, like, I think people fail to remember. They're like, well, I got the gun, so I'm good. It's like, well, I mean, is your gun going to fix your open wound when you get one? It could. Explain. Okay, so here's the deal. We've all seen Rambo. Here's the deal. Okay, shoot it until the barrel gets hot and then no, burn it no, shut. No, better yet. James, you have a non-arterial bleed, but you have an open wound that is bleeding. Okay. Okay, so we're in a tough situation. We also have to make a fire to keep you warm because you fell out of the raft, and um, I pulled you out of the ice. I told you watch. not to wear that cotton sweatshirt. <laughs> well, actually, Jim's wearing the Sun Slayer hoodie, which is a synthetic blend that does dry quickly. Um, <laughs> you can find it at Vortex. Optics we sometimes. take a 22 long rifle shell and we pull the bullet off and you've got this gash on your arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I sprinkle the very fast burning powder inside of the 22 long rifle into your cut. James, it burns and you're like, oh, it hurts real bad. I'm Are you like, going to light it on fire? I am. Bite down you on this. Savage son of a... And we... And woof. And you've now cauterized the wound. You think that is going to be enough is this to cauterize a thing? Have the you wound? Seen it? Where'd you learn? It's did, in Rambo. This, it was in a movie. Did you make this up? Or? No, this is completely real. From Rambo? It could have been. <laughs> um, Except I also, he, he took apart, from what I recall, like a, uh, a very large... Uh, Why can't I remember that? I just watched Rambo with my wife. I must not have watched the right one. Is this Rambo uh, I, Returns or whatever? I don't know. Okay. But I can't remember. nonetheless, whoosh, cauterization. We're good. Jim, you're back up and running. Okay, also, we need to build a fire, but none of us smoke. None of us have a lighter. We're in this, you know, PNW basin. I take a second 22 long rifle shell. Now, bear in mind, I have expelled less than an ounce of anything here, so we're, we're good. I pop the lead cap off this, and I take a small snipping of cotton from Mark's cotton shirt. That's dry because he didn't fall in the river. And I kind of tear out the fibers a little bit. And I, I stuff that inside of the, the case. And with, oh, excuse me, I got to back up. I took some powder and I sprinkled it on some pine duff. And then I've got a small pile of kindling above it. And then I take that cotton and I stuff it in the case and I put it in the gun and I fire it. The priming compound burns and turns that cotton wadding into an ember of sorts. How are you going to get it out? It goes down the barrel. And oh, I, you point the gun. I think we to, need to, we need to ground truth this one. Yeah, this needs some. Let's testing. rock and roll. Let's rock and roll. We can do it. That's this no needs big deal. some testing. Yeah, and I don't. I I zap that burning cotton fiber into this pine duff laced with fast burning gunpowder. Whoosh! It lights up. We have a fire. I then take the third twenty two long rifle cartridge. There is a squirrel over there. Zap. And Mark has a little bit of Tabasco in his pack, and we make squirrel with Tabasco. It actually did address everything that I brought up. Uh, aside from the light. The light. The oh, light. You're going to need a light. Um, your gun can't be your light. It just can't. This gun has a Picatinny rail on it. Okay. And attached yeah, to yeah, it. It's gonna, but you're going to have a light attached to it. Exactly. Okay. That's the only thing it doesn't do. It doesn't do a flashlight. Right. But no gun does a flashlight. Exactly. Okay. That's what I'm getting at. So here's what I, I, I propose another thing, and, and maybe this should be put to a vote, and maybe this will get edited out. But I say there's a survival week challenge done, um, and Mark takes his arm. You take your arm. Yes. And We've talked about this. For a week. Um, it kind of blends all the best of um, some of the survival shows that were on the Discovery Channel. Yeah, along, like Naked and Afraid. Yeah, along with the Office episode in which Michael Scott heads into the woods to survive for a week. <laughs> and let's just see who ends up with dysentery and who ends up fine. Yeah, yeah I mean, we get, to bring, uh, we get to bring a water purifier, right? Purifier? Maybe. Maybe. We'll, uh, if the water looks the... clear, it's fine, right? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. If you can't see it, it can't hurt you. That's right. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, um, man, survival rifles. Let's try, let's also toss out because we did this with the sub guns one. Let's toss out some other ones that are out there. Like I said, on the table here, we got the little badger. I think it's pretty neat. Uh, it's got some 
some bullet holders there in the stock. Very clever. And uh, I've wrapped it in paracord, uh, which I uh, sort of figured out how to weave it. And uh, you've got the old 1022 takedown. Uh, the Ruger now has the uh, the nine mil rifle. Yeah, the PCC. Too, right? Oh, that's pretty cool. Right. Yeah, or PC nice carbine, one. excuse me. PC carbine. Yeah, now that'd be pretty neat. Yep. Um, but then you have. Uh, I mean, what else is out there? There is um, Chiapa, I believe, now makes their own modern version of the M7. Oh, cool. And you mm-hmm. can get in a, a smattering of um, over unders, and it's not just twenty two LR four ten. I think you, you can even get some other gauges and some other calibers. Uh, what else do you have out there? Um, of course, the TP-82, you know. Correct, <laughs> correct. Uh, the combination guns are a thing. You can get combination guns. Um, you know, they're usually extremely expensive uh, for a, a German-crafted drilling. Yeah. Uh, but they're real. They're viable. Mm-hmm. Uh, Savage, with their combination gun, mm-hmm. still available. You can get those. Um, how about there was this one gun that was out for a while. It was called some kind of survival rifle, and it actually had a fishing reel integrated into the stock. That I am unfamiliar so 22, with. 22, single shot. And yeah, it had a fishing reel. It had a integ- fishing reel, or it just held some fishing line in the stock? Uh, no, it would, it, you stuck a fishing reel onto the bottom of the pistol grip, and then the line came up and went down the stock, and you could go fishing with it. That's pretty. That's pretty novel. I like that. That's I'm unfamiliar unique. with this. Um, that you, you don't have to shoot your fish. No. Jerry Mitchell told us that he used to shoot fish, though. I'm not surprised. <laughs> you can, um, in a lot of different spots, you can you can definitely hand line some fish, no problem. Yep, yep. You know, and this sounds like it gives you a little bit of extra extension as well. Yep. Maybe the, a little bit of, um, the Henry, I don't talk down about it. The maybe. Henry AR-7, you could put stuff in right. the buttstock. Yeah. So we could do a... Uh, that is a really unique one. Yeah. The fact that it all goes into its buttstock and then floats. There's the Mossberg neat. 500 JIC kit. What is that? It comes in an orange tube, so if you drop the tube in the weeds... I know what you're talking about. Yeah, there. the JIC kit has a 500 Persuader. Which is the pistol gripped eighteen and a half inch pump shot? The one that looks like a pirate gun. Yep. Okay. And that goes in a tube, and then the tube also has provisions for some spare ammunition, a first aid kit, a possible potential MRE kind of thing, um, or you know even even a provision of fishing line and your favorite uh, spinner baits. Um, floating tube, environmentally sealed. Bury in the backyard situation. Throw it in the back of the UTV. I'm trying to put find it, it Jim, where it doesn't. Uh like have a make sound gonna, well, yeah where it's not going to play a video and that's just not uh it's right uh, now. actually simple mark you just go to uh you're on google and then you just hit images instead of videos hmm. no mm-hmm. no no i'm no, just, gonna, I'm just there. gonna type in images jim well no it's still not going to do it if you type it in you actually have to tap images at the top <sighs> there there they are okay got it the mossberg jic wow that is that is cool and jic just in case and it is very cool I think I think uh, that's a survival gun. That should that should make honorable mention. Definitely. Yeah. Can you uh, spin a choke into the end of that, or is the, no. the persuader? If no. it's like mine, you can't. It's just you. You could probably have one put in. Do you need chokes when you're in a survival situation? I don't think is so. Is that important? I don't think so. You know. So I'm going to go. Oh gosh. Now I'm changing my survival gun. I want to put the Roni on the list too. To? Are you changing it? Are you want to put what? The Roni. The Roni's got to be on there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, for sure. Let me ask it's this your question. I, and everything I, is Glock Mag compatible these days. It seems to be. You'll find like a rock out in the wild that'll Glock be Mag Glock compatible. Compatible. Yes. I have a question, and maybe I don't know if you've done any testing or you probably know all about it, Ryan. The uh, the effectiveness of a 410 slug for big game. Like uh, so ballistically, it's not terribly far off of a 9mm Luger. Okay, so my question is like I'm I'm going back to the thought of like carrying more rounds. Sure, and you're going to definitely be able to carry more rounds of 410 than 12. It's going to take up less space. That's true. And do you small. have your shotgun be the you know a mix of 410 birdshot and slugs. I think that would be okay. It would be lighter. It would be quieter. It would have lower recoil. It can absolutely kill a grouse or a, a oh, bunny. My goodness, yeah, a squirrel. Um, and the 410 slug is. Would not be my first choice if I was to be hunting in a slug zone for a no. shotgun. Untold sums of deer have succumbed to the. I want to say it's like 
an 11 sixteenths ounce slug, if I recall. Um, two I'm talking probably like 50 yards and in. Yeah. In the, you know, shoot them in the legs. Yeah, I think that would work. Two and a half inch or three inch slug. You can also get three ball or four ball buckshot loads. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's a viable option. The JIC mm-hmm. is available in 410. No way. Not advocating, just... The pistol grip thing throws me off, though. I don't know how I feel about a shotgun that you can't shoulder. Yeah. I think, overall, I would be more a proponent to the, the conventional stock yeah. than with the pistol grip. Um, can we just entertain, briefly, the survival situation in which you now need to go into survival mode just at your house? You're not stranded anywhere, but it's being attacked by big planes overhead and people parachuting out and tanks driving down your block. In What's this case, rifle? I'm going to lend myself the AR platform yes. or something similar. Will you stick with the seven and a half or are you going to go with a 16 inch or something like that? Um, like a 12 and a half maybe? No. I, it's kind of a moot point. Any? Yeah. Because remember, you, you know, remember the day I mean, that you we almost took, stick with the shorty in case you got a bail. Yeah. We, you know, we took your 14.5 when we were at our outdoor to, we shot that to 800 yards. Yes. And I have shot also my 11 and a half out to 500. And we were hitting steel well. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was, it wasn't the best choice, but you could certainly do it. One has to ask the question, how far do you suspect you would be engaging at that point in time? And maybe that's an, maybe that's an undefinable at this point. I don't know. I would think from my residence, my opportunity for distance is limited to, you know, perhaps 150 yards. Yeah. Um, in which case I want volume. I want some knockdown. Yep. I think that would be a better choice. Um, than than my single shot 12 gauge with a, <laughs> with a 22 long rifle. Dude, insert. you're going to have to set up multiple single shot 12 gauges yeah. and pull Mel Gibson from the Patriot with yes. them all hidden behind different Correct. trees. And then you just run tree to tree and yeah. Yep. Mark? Am I, am I picking? Am yes. You, you're making because me I know, pick? Yes. I, I'm making you pick because I'm pretty sure that I know that you're right now, if somebody breaks into your house, they're getting a 300 wisdom to the face and, they're, and then they're going to hear. And now it is an AR <laughs> though. <laughs> That's yeah. True. Oh, okay. So it's not going to be a bolt gun. No. All right. No. No. I. When you brought up that scenario, my mind immediately went to the AR platform, hands down, like unequivocally. Yeah. Ro- Roni would be a good choice over there too. I would choose an AK forty-seven. Of course. I'm not going to tell you not because the bad guys are everywhere. They're most likely the ones you're going to be picking stuff up off of. Mm-hmm. Because let's be honest, our guys are going to be mopping up somewhere. You're not going to find a lot of them on the ground. That's Maybe true. mostly bad guys on the ground. Maybe they can loan you some ammo, though. I, I love the I love the <laughs> notion that the AK is the bad guy gun, though. How would it not be? I don't know. I've been watching a lot of blacklists lately. They've got everything from like weird stuff that never existed to like HK XC8s and weird stuff, and it's not always AKs. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know either. We're working on some big assumptions here. It's pro- you're right, though. It's pr- probably is. It probably is the the AK. That's a good choice. I'm gonna stick with the AK. Works good. <laughs> All okay. right. Did we discuss? <laughs> I don't. I don't know where we got. I don't know what we discussed. We discussed survival rifles, though. That's for sure. We came up with a lot of the thing is. It's all like scenario it's driven. One hundred percent imaginative, or you're driven by your imagination. A survival rifle can only be used by whatever your imagination can conjure up that you're going to find yourself in. Mm -hmm. Now, you may know that you're going to go on a trip here, and if something happens along the way, maybe there is a better firearm than others to be on your person or in your vehicle or in your spacecraft. Um, So in that case, that firearm is the best survival firearm for that situation. So I, it's, that's why it is hard to say why there is, like, a best survival rifle. There are these ones, though, that get sort of pegged with unique features, like the fact that they break down or they shoot a certain caliber or they've got a funny optic mount that somehow puts an optic on a gun that folds in three pieces or something, and they get called survival rifles. But I think that a survival rifle could be anything. And, like you said, Ryan, it's better than a sharp stick. I'll tell you one. Uh, my, my buddy... Uh 
But yeah, Hunt with he's he carries with him a big wheel gun everywhere he goes. He's got a, a couple of custom Ruger uh, Blackhawks, and he has a Blackhawk chambered in 475 line ball, uh, which is a big cartridge that he makes birdshot loads out of that are not terribly far off of a 28 gauge. And um, so his answer to this question is he's bringing whatever centerfire rifle that he chooses. He shoots a Steyr Scout rifle quite often. Um, and then this big wheel gun with a mix of uh, regular centerfire wheel gun cartridges and these birdshot cartridges. That's kind of slick. That is slick. He would... He loads like number sixes in them. He's he's like shot clay pigeons and flying birds with that. Seriously, yep, yeah, works pretty slick. I mean, you do Just have like, a close range repeater. Yep, and then can dispatch small game. Yep, yep. Hmm. Well, there's another thought. Let's hear your ideas, Vortex Nation podcast listeners. Let's hear what you guys are using for your survival rifles. Do you even have a quote survival rifle? Uh, what are your thoughts around it? All that stuff. Let us know. Hit us up on uh, Instagram. If you're watching on YouTube, hit us up in the comments below. Uh, we'd be very curious to hear your thoughts. Mark, we're just waiting on you to say something uh, controversial because uh, everybody thinks that I hate the 1911 and uh, Ryan accidentally said he's anti-Air 15 when Whoops. he was <laughs> trying to say that he j- it, they're just not that exciting to him. I've, so. I'm sure I probably have said it in an in a, I'm unaware. Mark gentlemen. has yet to say anything mega controversial, but we're just going to wait on that uh, to happen. I try actually. to keep it safe. You know that, Jim. I do know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll catch you next time. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. I got to look into one of those brownie kits for my Glock. I, want I don't one have one yet, but I Cody, want one. That Cody thing just amazing. got one. Did he? Yeah. They're cool. They've upgraded them, and now they're, like, super put together. Well, uh, yeah, when they first came out, I remember I was a little bit like, a lot of know about Palmer. That. Yeah, and now, so but now they're they're good. Yeah. Do you recommend getting a Glock um, 17 to go with that, or does it not matter? I mean, the nice part about a 19 is you can put 17 or 19 magazines in it. That's true. But, I mean, let's be honest, you're going to put the 33-rounder in there anyway. Duh. What difference does it make? Like, look at the. So this is the. Vid- and, this and is yeah. the video. <laughs> this is this is the video that I played when I was looking for images. <laughs> if, if it came down to it, and you had a 17, and all of a sudden you came across a store of 19 magazines, you take a hacksaw and you cut your grip off. <laughs> yep, yep. I used to work with a guy that did that. He carried a 34 that he 19 the grip on. Yeah. It's the opposite of the 19x. Yeah, it's like the 19XXL, <laughs> and uh, he um, that was his that was his preferred arm. But they're slick, they're a cool gun. I want to see you guys do survival dual survival week. So Jim we and I talked about this. this survival this survival like three thing. days. You go into the woods with just your survival rifle and a water purifier. Nobody needs to get sick, right? <laughs> but and then you it's a no food operation, and you need to catch. If you've got if you if you got fishing line, in your or kill, I mean it's living off squirrels and other small things, mice, whatever. Having done this a multitude of times, mul- multiple times, probably both. Uh, Orion brand seven minute road flares. They're this big. They come in three packs or six packs, I believe. You can burn anything with a road flare. You got wet wood, doesn't matter road flare they weigh nothing they light underwater that's your pn dub special right there because i was going to ask you where you're finding your dry wood in your with an orion brand seven minute road flare about the size of a crayola marker (laughs) speaking of really speaking of testing things we need to test the firing of the ember conjured up through crazy backwoods 22 fire starter man okay look it up and Jim, we're gonna have to cut you and 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 cauterize the wound. Okay, it'll happen. I get caught cut myself in stupid shit all the time. So then I'll just it'll, uh, it'll, it'll work. Have a twenty-two on hand. You don't buy it. <sighs> Here's just, what I'll tell you for that's, sure. I feel like it sounds you're, like instant you're infection. fast burning powder. I I don't disagree that you're gonna be able to get a spark. I don't think it's gonna light anything on fire. It sounds like instant infection. 
I'll be trying to talk about the cut or the fire starter. No, there's antimicrobial properties to these this uh, gunpowder in itself. Yeah, Is there really? that's true. Yeah. I didn't realize that. And then when you hit that, of course, thing I think the, I heard that from you. So with a with a I'm ter- with a hot yes. flame, wow! And then you're like, oh, okay. Well, I no longer have use of that arm. All right, perfect. I'm not bleeding <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yeah, um, I think you guys should do that today. I think you should go catch, well, not cut yourself, but do do the pull the bullet, put the cotton in there. That's a thing. That's like a that's like that's a long tested known survival technique. Pull the bullet, dump the powder into what you need to burn. Don't do it too close because otherwise the primer and the propulsion of air it's will gonna... blow your way. But that's like that's an old hat. Everybody knows that one. Okay, so why don't I uh, carry a lighter? You don't have a lighter. Yeah, but I carry a lighter. Mark, here's what happened. In fact, I carry two. When the boat tipped over, it fell out of your pocket yep. and a very large salmon, thinking it was. Because you had a fish lighter, a big with a little fish on it. It's like, oh, God. <laughs> big old salmon. Chinook. You could try to catch the fish. That would be there you go. impressive. That's why I have the fishing line in my survival rifle. I get my yeah. lighter back. <laughs> to catch the salmon. That took your lighter. <laughs> There's a lighter in the salmon in the hole in the bottom of the river. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mark dies trying to catch the fish. That took his life. He's got a pile of salmon behind him. It's just like a really good one comes out. Ah, uh, you're not the one. Holds it up to like, son of a... <laughs> Give that a whirl. Look, it's raining. It's perfect. Maybe that's just the vents. No, no it's, it's raining. raining. Okay. It's quite hard. Go I'm glad I, I, almost, uh, I almost went to the car wash this morning. I'm glad I didn't. Free car wash today. Yeah. Nature. I'm just saying um, it works. Is there a way that you could emulate the bleeding of tissue? No, you couldn't. You could take a hot dog, you could cut a hot well, dog. Well, I got an idea. Yeah. Let's test it on animals because... <laughs> well, hold on a sec. It's perfect. <laughs> animals can't feel. Because it has to be alive, though. It has to be able to bleed. Yeah. I'm not going to, like, yeah. cut something open and then I'm, burn it. I'm kidding. I'm, maybe you take, like, a hot dog and you, like, cut the hot it's dog. It's not going to... There's nothing, like, Well, bleeding. yeah, but you'd be able to tell if it was cauterized or not. You'd be like, oh, yeah, look at that. It cooked it. Yeah. That's how you cook your hot dog. Ryan knows... What's, Yes, thank you. You know who's going to win the survival challenge. Oh, he already This did. whole time. This whole time. He is on that episode of The Office. Ryan doesn't Dwight. actually even have a house. He's just been surviving his right. whole life. He just lives out in the conservancy. Just absolutely, totally comfortable, 100%. I noticed there's been a decrease of rabbits out there. Certainly a decrease in turkeys. Yes. Yeah, well, we did kill seven bunnies out of the adjacent conservancy, which I hope Travis ate by now. Speaking um, of bunnies, I gotta kick up that jackrabbit. I know. Do you have a jackrabbit in here? Two, yeah, two of them. We've got plans. Okay. Where did you come up with a jackrabbit? Remy Warren's house. Do they have jacks out here? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I tell you what, I've se- I tell you what, I te- <laughs> I say I say there is some rabbits in my yard. I looked out the other day, and I thought a damn dog was coming across my yard. And I looked out, and I was like, what the f-? And Did I you see a jackrabbit? freaking rabbit, we and it have, had we legs. We don't have jacks here. So whatever I saw, it had legs that long. That it was a rabbit like a with legs that fucking long. We it have, was humongous, we but have, it didn't have the ears like a jackrabbit. So there's a difference between have, desert like, jacks. We saw big Eagle. cottontails, what you saw. There's a difference between desert jacks. It's very different, though. Cottontails, cottontails stay up in little balls Unless all the time. They hop across. Shoe, but they, they hop across, and then they go like this. And they hop across, and they like that. This rabbit was like, it looked like he was like a dog, like, very long. It's a kangaroo! <laughs> <laughs> that guy was so excited. Hmm. Um, Maybe you saw the only one. And if we truly lost the jackrabbit in Wisconsin, how did such a common creature disappear so quickly? So they're talking about jackrabbits being gone, Jim. We no, have a... see, it wasn't a jackrabbit. I tell you what, that thing had some 
legs on it. You know, there's that other variety of um, that other variety of cottontail that's much larger. Dude, like I cannot win. That's what I with have. The internet lately. That's what I have in my yard. They are humongous. White-tailed jackrabbit. Where? Prairie hare or the white jack. Species of hare found in Western North America. Um, threatened. And Wisconsin is part of its range. Let me see it. That's the range map. You're talking oh. about the white-tailed jackrabbit right now, Yep, huh? and this is the rabbit. No, that's not what I saw. I think what I did, what I saw was a cottontail, but I'm telling you, like, cottontails don't normally stand up to the height of, like... Well, we have two varieties of cottontails, right? We have regular cottontails, and then we have the swamp cottontail. Swamp Rabbit, Wisconsin. Hey, you're going to like this video, by the way, right? Hey, what are you doing? Tossing bikes in the river, bro. <laughs> that is awesome. What is that from? No, it's just a TikTok video. I don't know. Just tossing bikes in the river, bro. <laughs> it's so useless and brings such joy. Do we have swamp rabbits in Wisconsin? Yeah, is that like a myth? Is that like one of those things? I don't know. There's a difference, though. You sure? Yes. Swamp rabbits are way bigger. Uh, yeah, are they bigger like brown bears are bigger on the coast, Ryan? Are brown bears bigger on the coast, Mark? Yes. Bigger than gri interior grizzlies, quotation marks. Are you a non-grizzly believer? Well, I believe what... I have heard the science tells me and that they're genetically the same. From Wisconsin DNR, there is only one rabbit species in Wisconsin, but two species of hare, snowshoe and white-tailed jackrabbit. Is the white-tailed jackrabbit in southern Wisconsin? Yes. Really? Yes. Maybe that's what I well, saw. I bet you can't shoot them then, huh? You're probably know. not supposed to, or I don't know. They say they're in... Fine, right? I am aware of a small pocket of jackrabbits in my hometown. They live at the airport. Best place to live, no guns allowed. I think that's why they are still there. But this is uncanny. We used to goose hunt right off it. You, you can don't see think it. that they were released by somebody no, somehow? Because we used to have jacks out by my folks' place. Did you want to play around with this? No, I just go back to. I, I, defend myself as the ultimate defense and survive eating small things rifle. That's what I'm bringing. Wait till you see the roni. That's too big a bullet for squirrels. You think nine is too big for squirrels? Mm -hmm. Shoot him in the head. No, I, I think it's fine. You center punch a squirrel with a nine? You know what you get? Nine millimeter hole through a squirrel. Yeah, you're right. Nothing happens. Thank you, both Ryans. Yes, thank you. Okay, l level of accuracy. Oh, considerably better. Better with the nine? Than? Than 22. Oh, I thought we were talking like pistol versus Roni to pistol. Oh, no. Yeah, you'd, you'd win with the 22. It doesn't matter if it doesn't fall out of the tree, Ryan. That's true. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.